Sharon Carter was a staple of the late 90s, early 2000s pop culture, and a name everyone who grew up in that era immediately recognizes. Born Aaron Charles Carter on December 7, 1987, alongside his twin sister Angel, he's mostly known for his contribution to the 90s teen pop wave and for being the little brother of the Backstreet Boys member Nick Carter. Aaron started his career as an opener for his brother's band, singing covers of many classic songs such as Crush on You by the Jets. His career started off similar to Nick's in Germany, his album being produced by the highly questionable Lou Pearlman. But Pearlman, like with the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, skyrocketed Aaron to fame with his first self-titled album in 1997 at the age of nine, which achieved gold status in multiple countries in Europe and later in his home country, the U.S., in 1998, solidifying him as a household name for kids across the world. With his brother's band exploding in the late 90s, Aaron had a huge opportunity to take advantage of his brother's fame and would get spots as being an opener for not only the Backstreet Boys, but also Britney Spears, and he made numerous TV appearances on Nickelodeon and Disney. His real hit at superstardom came with his 2000 album Aaron's Party, Come and Get It, under Jive Records, which featured the song of the same name, That's How I Beat Shaq, and a cover of the Strange Loves track, I Want Candy, a song which I loved as a kid and I had no clue it was a cover until my mid-twenties. The album hit platinum when he was only 12 years old, living the life many 2000s kids could only imagine. He was so popular he even caught the attention of the late Michael Jackson, who took him under his wing for a few years as he was living his wild dream. Due to his erratic behavior in adulthood, it led many to speculate if he was a kid that Michael allegedly harmed, which Aaron vehemently denied throughout his life. He even made an acting debut in March 2001 on the hit show Lizzie McGuire, which is a Christmas special in March, which is kind of a strange choice if you ask me. He was paired up with the star Hilary Duff, which ended with them kissing and an iconic performance of I Want Candy that every 2000s kid remembers fondly, and the start of Aaron and Hilary's roller coaster relationship throughout their teens. Let's be honest, I'm sure that episode alone caused many girls to have super unrealistic expectations later in life. His last huge platinum hit came with his third studio album release of Oh Aaron in 2001, featuring the song of the same name, which also featured his brother Nick and the girl group No Secrets, whose existence I totally forgot about until researching for this video, even though I loved their songs as a kid. Other notable songs from the album was a kind of creepy song also featuring Nick called Not Too Young, Not Too Old, with a super flashy 2000s style video. It's catchy for a bubblegum pop track, but listen to the lyrics. They really are kind of creepy. They had him sing about not being too young for the girls, but not being too old to perform or something. And also, what's with, with that hairstyle Nick has on in the video? I'm glad that one went away fast. But anyway, he was also notable for con contributing to many movie soundtracks like Leave It Up To Me from his O Aaron album, Go Jimmy Jimmy and AC's Alienation for the Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius movie, and his song Life Is A Party for Rugrats in Paris from his previous album. Both of those were some of my favorites also when I was a kid because I grew up with those movies and they were awesome. His fourth album, Another Earthquake, was released September 2002 featuring the patriotic American AO, and the ballad Do You Remember. Sadly, the album didn't reach the same success as his previous three, though he still stayed busy performing on the Nick show All That and PBS's Liberty Kids, also performing the vocals to the latter's theme song Through My Eyes with a girl named Kayla Hinkle. The song was awesome for a cartoon about history. Sadly, though, all good things must come to an end, and slowly cracks began to break through the glittery facade. His parents in the same year sued Lou Pearlman, alleging that he owed them hundreds of thousands of dollars in royalties. The situation wasn't entirely straightforward as the Carters had signed a contract with Pearlman, and without the guy, Aaron wouldn't have had a career along with the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. But knowing the nature of producers and the fact that Pearlman was arrested for pushing the biggest Ponzi schemes ever, it's likely that there's a lot of truth to what Aaron's parents were alleging, even though others think they were just trying to get more money after the disappointment of another earthquake. At the end, though, the situation was settled outside of court. 
Regardless, though, interest in Aaron Carter seemed to have been on the decline since Aaron was reaching 18, which seems to happen to every child star when they reach adulthood, which is kind of disturbing when you really think about it. A Greatest Hits album was released in 2003, which was an obvious cash grab that no one asked for, and a sign that Jive was dropping Aaron and was trying to milk him for every last penny. Perlman, though, still had faith in him as a singer, and so signed him onto his own label, Transcontinental, where Aaron released the song Saturday Night in 2005. The song had somewhat moderate success, as it wasn't a bad song. In fact, it was actually a step up from his other releases, which, yeah, they were kids' songs, but some were pretty cringe, especially as Aaron got older. I mean, I still like some of the songs from when he was a kid, like I Want Candy and Even Through My Eyes, the theme song for Liberty Kids, but others like Go Jimmy Jimmy or Oh Aaron are obviously for kids, and Saturday Night was more of a step towards Aaron releasing more serious, mature music, which by then I'd say was long overdue. But it didn't reach the success it needed for Aaron to keep going, which was a shame. Jive Records released yet another Greatest Hits album in 2006, which was even dumber than the first one and shows just how greedy these record companies are. Adding insult to injury, all the songs on the album were recorded before 2003, which shows just how little faith they had in Aaron after he turned 18, which is really shocking as even though I would admit that he isn't the best singer ever, he still had so much talent and charisma that he really could have carried a career just like his brother. To make things even more rough for Aaron, Lou Pearlman also couldn't keep his back savvy side in check and filed a lawsuit against him in 2006, citing that Aaron had reneged on a recording deal, but because Aaron was 17 at the time of signing, his attorney pointed out that Aaron had the right to cancel or void agreements he made as a minor, which reveals how creepy and scummy Lou really was. But Pearlman went on the run later that year because he was being investigated for defrauding investors out of $1 billion. Yes, really. The biggest Ponzi scheme in the world. But on Lou's arrest, Aaron was finally free. However, the story doesn't end as happily as one would have wanted. With every dream, it eventually must come to an end. Aaron was probably left feeling used and disgruntled with the music industry after finding that he had essentially been used and cast aside along with finding that all the money that he had made as a kid had been taken by his parents. And to add insult to injury, his brother career was still popping, even though it too had a bit of a downturn. To help carry on his adult career, he joined his siblings in the 2006 reality show House of Carters, featuring all the Carter siblings, ranging from Nick to Aaron, his twin sister Angel, Leslie, and Bobby Jean, and it was an obvious attempt to follow them as they tried to revive their careers. Reality TV was huge in the 2000s thanks to shows like The Simple Life, all leading to some of the trashiest times on TV. The show only ran for 8 episodes and really wasn't a good show at all, but it did expose them as a super toxic, narcissistic family. Aaron, around that time, had also developed a bad relationship with their mother after she ripped him off most of his money, which exposed her as a typical stage mom who essentially pimped out her boys for fame just to live vicariously through them and pocketed the money. The situation left Aaron broke, and he ended up disappearing for a few years out of the public eye once the show was canceled. Even before the show ended and his hiatus, Aaron's life had started getting erratic, with years of his on-and-off-again PR relationship with Hilary Duff and Lindsay Lohan, all of which the media ate up like no tomorrow. Once again, super creepy when you really think how obsessed everyone was with a bunch of teenagers and their relationship drama. And Aaron's parents got a divorce, which Aaron was informed of just before going on MTV Cribs, and was still forced to go on filming. Even at the peak of his fame and, his, and in his teens, you could see the pain and sadness in his eyes in interviews, which really makes one wonder what was going on behind closed doors. His mother was arrested in 2007 for breaking into his dad's house and beating up his girlfriend while Aaron was there. Sadly, the arrest didn't end with just his mother, as Aaron himself got arrested in 2008 after they found substances in his car. 2009 was the year Aaron finally made a return to TV, appearing on Dancing with the Stars and getting fifth place on the show. While on the show, he was regularly taking Xanax to calm his anxiety and panic attacks. At the same time, Aaron also tried to return to music, releasing online the single Dance With Me featuring Flo Rida and Let Go. Though they were very much of the time, the tracks aren't that bad, but again, it didn't gain the traction 
only amounting to 100,000 views. It was disappointing for Aaron as it was supposed to be his big comeback after years away from music. In 2011, he ended up in rehab to help treat emotional issues and addiction to substances, with Aaron releasing a statement on not being afraid to be human. He completed a month's treatment before going back to performing again. Things didn't get any better in 2012 when his sister Leslie ended up passing away from an OD at the age of 25. Just like her brothers, she was pushed by their mom into music, only releasing one song, and she also struggled with mental health and substance issues. Aaron sadly had a lot to say about his sister once she passed away. He, years later in 2019, came out with the allegation of her harming him on X, formerly Twitter, between the ages of 10 and 13, when she wasn't on her bipolar medication. He also alleged that two of his first backup dancers harmed him, too, and added that his brother as well to the allegation, saying that he bullied him throughout his life, which probably isn't far from the truth, as we saw in a highly shared clip from the House of Carters. Aaron was starting to speak out against his family in the mid-2010s, which many criticized him for doing so after his sister's passing. However, he probably feared retaliation, so it was no surprise that he waited until then to at least say that one. His financial problems didn't come to an end either. In 2013, he filed for bankruptcy after it came out that he was $3.5 million in debt, including owing the IRS $1.3 million. That prompted him to go back to touring in 2013 with his after-party tour, which he regularly got 300 people in the audience, which is impressive for someone who hadn't had a hit since childhood. He spent the tour performing his old songs, offering his audience loads of nostalgia and good memories. It was a pretty intense experience for him having to perform at 150 shows in both the U.S. and Canada. Like, wow. But he had to do it in order to avoid jail time. He didn't even slow down in the next year, kicking off another tour in 2014 in Canada, and then a worldwide tour entitled Wonderful World Tour along with releasing new songs on SoundCloud. Adding new songs to his discography, including Oh We and Wonderful World. His first EP was released in 2015, titled The Music Never Stopped, which was then followed up by his fifth studio album, Love, a few years later, in 2018, after releasing various singles such as Fool's Gold and Sooner or Later. He had more creative control and even co-directed a music video for his song Curious, though it's hard to gauge how much creative control he had. He ended up upsetting a lot of fans, though, on tour, as he was only performing his new songs. While I can understand why his fans wanted to hear some of his old songs, I can also sympathize with Aaron here, too. The fact that his fans wanted his old songs probably rubbed salt in the wound that he only peaked in his childhood, and he hadn't been able to gain the same level of success that he had been able to in his childhood. And he was also trying to reinvent himself, and he probably felt as if he was being held back, not being able to evolve beyond his childhood years. He continued to spread his wings musically as he started to collaborate with new artists such as Dead Mouse and Huey Mack, both of whom got him into music festival set lists. Though they weren't always loyal friends, with examples such as Huey Mack going on shows revealing Aaron's financial struggles, such as him living in someone's guest house and driving a 1992 BMW. Which I'd say, way to air out some dirty laundry, buddy. Really not cool. Sadly, to make Aaron's money issues worse, an intern around the time also claimed that he owed him around 50k. Aaron's life was also packed with loads of public feuds, even outside his own family. One of the most significant was with fellow child star Justin Bieber, or more Justin's entertainment attorney, Aaron Rosenberg, who said in 2015 how glad he is that Justin didn't end up like Aaron. The two stars got into a Twitter spat, but later on made up. Aaron responded to questions surrounding the feud on Oprah's Where Are They Now, discussing how he would regularly give Justin advice on how to navigate childhood stardom, which I think Aaron discussed in a calm, mature way. Honestly, it's kind of dumb for the attorney to have made that comment, since looking at Justin, he's not exactly in a good mental state either, seeing his unstable marriage, ex-girlfriend stalking him, and his own substance problems and erratic behavior. The fact that Aaron managed to get a following after a decade and regain relevancy is extremely impressive if you ask me. It's a real shame that all of that had to get in the way as Justin and Aaron could have done a collab which would have gained Aaron even more 
relevancy again at that point, but such is life, I guess. Aaron's behavior, though, would get increasingly erratic as years passed, which often didn't help his case. There was footage released of him in 2017 randomly shouting at people in Malibu. Adding even more to his trials in the same year, his father passed away from a heart attack, which absolutely devastated Aaron, who looked up to his father as a hero, and clearly had a deep attachment to, as also seen in the show House of Carters. Sadly, after that, his run-ins with the law didn't end either. He got a DUI, and sadly, many noted he looks very gaunt in the mug shot. He was able to bond out of jail relatively quickly. Even though he was released from jail, Aaron was still going through mental breaks. He allegedly threatened family members after buying a gun and threatening to off himself. He also crashed his car, leaving him with injuries such as a broken nose. The former situation was alleged, though, and he slammed the press for how they reported on it, as well as affirming that he talks to nobody in his family except his mom. After that, he appeared on the show Doctors to discuss his situation and his mental health conditions, which included him explaining his gaunt appearance, for which many thought he had cancer, though it was proven not to be the case. His appearance on the show also included him being diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia. He would also go on the show to discuss his frustration and his devastation over the fact that he was getting so much hate online, especially after he had spent the entirety of his childhood entertaining and working, and only to see that those fans have turned on him, all of which was incredibly sad to hear. After his appearance on the show, he would continue on threatening to off himself, all of which raised concern with the police. Then he disappeared for a few days in rehab. So much happened that year and in the next few years, it's so hard to keep up with all of which gave TMZ a ton of ammo to use against him. However, for better or for worse, it gained him some relevance again. 2018 was another interesting year for him. Alongside releasing his before-mentioned fifth album, Love, he also came out as bi through Twitter, which he, though, contradicted the statement in a Vlad interview where he admits all of his past relationships have been with women, though later on released a tweet saying he still finds men attractive. Regardless, the statement got him a ton of clout, and he later got loads of gigs in gay clubs. All of that coincided with his album Love, which each single from it gained a few million views on YouTube. Sadly, though, 2018 also had a lot of ups and downs, as he had a run-in with some girl named Selena Powell, who went on an interview basically trashing him, saying that she only saw him because she thought he was Nick Carter and claimed he was living in a shack and was on loads of prescription medications. He tried correcting her by saying he's the I Want Candy guy, and she asked him to sing it, which was clearly a massive trigger for him, and he got angry at her for it. I wouldn't be surprised if his old music probably has a lot of bad memories associated with it. The girl, though, was just really trash. I mean, let's be honest, that's a sort that's in L.A., Poor Aaron. He really could never get a break with the girls. 2019 was another year he regained even more relevancy with a series of no-jumper interviews. There, he discusses how much money he made and trying to prove his intelligence. He also detailed more of Nick's treatment of him, saying that Nick had essayed him, as well as admitting he started dealing with substances when he was 15 years old since his parents wouldn't give him pocket money, and he many times defended his intelligence and IQ. Once again, the interviews got millions of views. Though he is erratic and oftentimes very defensive about his intelligence for much of it, once again, I can't blame him seeing what he went through, including all that MK Ultra monarch programming. I mean, look at that. He's got a monarch butterfly face tattoo. Yeah, I know it's supposedly in honor of his late sister Leslie, but I bet there's some double meaning in it. I mean, monarch butterflies are the butterflies of choice in Hollywood, aren't they? Now, going back to his allegations against Nick, those came out as a response to Nick's 2019 restraining order against Aaron after he allegedly claimed that he had thoughts of offing him and his then-pregnant wife, Lauren Kitt. Aaron's twin sister also filed for restraining order, too, which must have been a major punch in the gut for Aaron, as that's his twin. There's been a lot of debate over whether or not those allegations were true since there was never any proof shown for Aaron saying any of that. And things got even messier, when Aaron was claiming that Nick was only 
filing for that restraining order in response to him backing at the time Melissa Schumann, who was claiming that he had essayed her back in the day, which had been adding on to even more allegations against Nick that he's been getting since pretty much the early 2000s. But then Aaron did end up backtracking on his support of Melissa Schumann and even straight up apologized to his brother publicly for supporting her. At the end of it, though, the whole feud between the Carter brothers is really convoluted and complicated. While I do lean more towards the Melissa Schumann allegations being mostly false, I do kind of wonder if Nick has some skeletons in his closet, to put it politely. And as for Aaron, I definitely don't think that Aaron is completely innocent either, though I do have a lot more sympathy for him for many reasons. The thing I will say with Aaron is he did seem to have some integrity issues as he often would just blurt stuff out and at the very least grossly exaggerate things. Though I don't ever think that he ever was fully lying about anything. So I am convinced that this stuff did go down between him and Nick. What the nature of it was, I don't know. But I definitely think that we can all agree that all of this was the result of Nick and Aaron coming from an incredibly messed up family. 2019 was also when Aaron continued on getting into even more controversies and he got into just so many over his life that it's hard to keep up with. One of the more major ones he got into was allegedly he was adopting dogs from shelters then selling them off to other people. However, Aaron denied those claims and the only evidence used to prove that he was doing that was an Instagram live he did with an English bulldog named Mighty, where he was heard saying that the dog was his best friend. If he couldn't keep him, he would be listed for $3,500. Aaron said that it was a joke and went on a Twitter rant venting frustrations over how the media uses his name always for negative clickbait. The Lancaster Animal Care, where he adopted the dog, also backed him up. Over the years, people were very critical of the way he cared for his dogs, Though, once again, all the evidence that is shown, I wouldn't necessarily say was very good evidence. I'm not saying that he was a very good dog owner, which I'm sure that there was a lot to be improved on, but I doubt that he was ever necessarily harming them maliciously or anything. So, he was by no means a perfect dog owner, but saying that he malic was malicious towards them is a bit of a stretch. But through all that, Aaron kept on appearing on No Jumper and carried on getting into even more controversies for better or for worse. They started really heating up when he brought on a girl he dated briefly named Jenna Shea, who isn't really known for doing much except dating famous guys like Soulja Boy and Lil Wayne. I know I've glossed over a lot of Aaron's dating life for a lot of this video as there's just so much to unpack in his short life, but if there's anything I would say about it, I would say he wasn't the most discerning when it came to dating. His relationship with Hilary Duff seemed to be healthier, but even that was on and off and seemed to be a major PR relationship, especially once Lindsay got involved. He was even engaged briefly back in 2006 to a former beauty queen and Playboy model named Carrie Ann Peniche, but he broke it off six days later, which probably was just as well since a few years later in 2009, there was a leaked tape of her getting it on with married actors. Then she went on a reality show called sex rehab with Dr. Drew and then later was diagnosed with BPD and substance addiction and her husband presumably they're still together accused her of infidelity and child abuse so yeah that wouldn't have been a healthy choice for Aaron let alone the guy she actually did end up marrying but Aaron took his at the time latest pick on the podcast and she stayed with him long enough for the attention but left him just as fast after she got the brunt of his manic depression the next girl he dated was a Russian model named Lena Valentina, who he was serious about, but sadly their relationship ended when she allegedly tried to stab him, and he had to get a restraining order against her. Yeah, he really knew how to pick them. He then went on to date Melanie Martin, who later became his fiance. The Jenna girl would regularly attack Melanie on Twitter, accusing her of just being with Aaron to get close to Nick, which honestly wasn't far from reality, seeing that other girl was just pursuing him because he was Nick's brother. Personally, at that point, I wouldn't trust any girl that was with Aaron. And I think there was a lot of pot calling the kettle black too. 
Aaron didn't seem to be able to find a girl who'd love him for him and not because he was the I want candy guy or Nick's brother, which sadly is all too common in Hollywood. 2020 came and even more craziness happened, like him making an OnlyFans account, which he posted stuff on there with Melanie, but slowed down the content when his Instagram and TikTok lives brought him more money. Honestly, I think it was more Melanie's idea than his to do OnlyFans. He still remained in his unstable relationship with Melanie. They often got into domestic disputes, one of which resulted in Aaron sustaining several injuries, and that was just a month after he got a face tattoo of her name along with several others, all of which I didn't think helped his case. Then weeks later, they announced their engagement and that they were expecting a baby, which was crazy considering what they were going through. Their son, Prince, named in honor of Michael Jackson, was born November 2021, which Aaron was incredibly happy about, though I'm sure there were many concerns over if he was stable enough to raise his son. He did lose custody of him in 2022, which his response was a check into rehab yet again, which was a sign he did genuinely want to get better. The years 2020 to 2022, he would often go on Instagram Live, airing his domestic disputes with Melanie, calling his mom on his phone, live streaming himself with his son before he lost custody, ranting about his life, his brother, Jesse McCartney, who we all totally forgot about until he randomly came up, and doing all sorts of shenanigans. Though his erratic personal life was what more often than not got him in the spotlight in adulthood, he did carry on making new music and was in process of trying to set up his own label and was making a new album. However, all of that was cut short when, tragically, he passed away at the age of 34 on November 5th, 2022. His passing had a lot of questions surrounding it, even though it was ruled as an accidental OD. His body was quickly cremated and little details were released to the public after that, at least officially. His mother ended up releasing photos from the scene in early 2023. In short, there were a lot of inconsistencies with the little that was reported and shows evidence that it was instead a crime scene. His mother, Jane, had pointed out how it was possible since Aaron had been receiving loads of death threats for years and would even livestream himself while asleep for fear of his life being taken. Evidence was shown in the photos such as the water in the bathtub where he was found had turned dark yellow, which means his body was there for a long time, like several days, and the photo of the floor showed his clothes had been left there, which is pretty sketchy since they should have taken the clothes. What was also a red flag was apparently, according to Jane, none of the photos were taken by police, but rather other people, which is also suspicious, and the casual way they handled it in general. Just discussing the evidence in detail would be a whole video in of itself, but let's just say it wouldn't be a surprise to me as Aaron already had a lot of enemies in the industry and was subjected to death threats on a regular, especially in the last few years of his life. He wanted to write a book exposing the dark secrets of the music industry and was very outspoken against many in that industry, including his own brother. I mean, the 2023 Grammy Awards left Aaron out of the in memoriam section, a major sign he was an enemy to the music industry elites. Now, I'm not completely ruling out the chance that Aaron had died from an accidental OD. There were some allegations he was still doing substances at the scene too, but if you see his lives a few days before his passing, which the YouTube channel Tesmosis showed in his video, We Failed Aaron Carter, Aaron was seemingly in good spirits while driving his RV, so it's worth noting the alternatives. He was constantly threatened and he would even tweet about how they and his family, quote, wanted to kill him off. He even at one point was urgently asking fans to fund him so he could escape to a, quote, undisclosed location. Who was he running from? I theorize handlers of some nature similar to Britney Spears. I mean, his passing was strangely reminiscent of Whitney Houston's back in 2012, where she too was found dead in her bathtub. She also was vocal against the music industry too. Another one of the many things that happened in 2020, which was cr a crazy year for everyone in general, Aaron got that before mentioned butterfly face tattoo in honor of his sister Leslie. But why a butterfly? and one similar to how so many elites get. He also shaved his head at one point similar to how Britney did back in 2007, and he even often compared himself to the star. I'd also note his profile picture on X, formerly Twitter, and the album cover are worth mentioning. Speaking of his last album, the aptly named Blacklisted was released two days after his death, though it was originally planned to be released on his birthday in the next month. 
The move was heavily criticized as an obscenely disrespectful and a heartless money grab and attention seeking on the part of his team. However, despite the obvious cash grab aspect to the release, it had a lot of songs worth mentioning like Scar, featuring 3D Friends, and especially City of Dreams, which featured lyrics like F-Boy out of LA, didn't know nobody, all alone in the city of dreams, looking for the crossroads, ready to sell my soul, which really goes for the throat and other lyrics include what seems to be, and this is my personal interpretation, Aaron switching between talking to God with lyrics like, look, please forgive me, you got me repenting. I know I didn't mean it. I got a life sentence. I wanted the fame to be a part of the game. Man, I was young. I didn't know a thing. And then he seems to be talking to the enemy, telling him, look me in the eyes. Tell me all these lies. What you see inside, wait, never mind. You were never mine. No, you were never mine. All of which were pretty hard hitting and pretty much calls out the music industry, not just on a physical level, but on the spiritual level too. I'm even surprised this was able to be released. So in short, Aaron had an extremely rough short life. You could argue he is the male version of Britney Spears, who he opened for early in her career. A guy who seemed to have everything, peaking at the age of 13, 14, then crashed hard after not being able to keep riding the wave. Probably a big reason was his label didn't want to bother with him after he hit puberty, and Aaron was just having constant bad luck. Some think he was just lazy, unlike his brother. However, Nick, I'm sure, was more willing to play along with the dirty industry tricks, while Aaron had more integrity in that way, and probably wanted more creative control. I mean, how can you call someone lazy if they were touring constantly doing 150 shows, especially after not performing for years? Yeah, the motivation too was getting out of debt, but working like that even to get out of debt is a sign he isn't lazy. The constant financial struggles, already coming from an unstable family, getting hard by people behind the scenes, getting fed substances and uppers by adults, just like Judy Garland and many other child stars were, MK Ultra freakiness and just being famous at such a young age all led to his hard decline in adulthood. Peaking at the age of 14 would have created a sense of loss as he hit his adult years, not knowing what to do afterwards. Being so famous too probably did give him a sense of entitlement, which came out hard, especially during his mental breaks. Also, being constantly in Nick's shadow didn't help him psychologically. I mean, imagine what it must have been like to have had your career start off as a joke, while your older brother was always taken seriously as a singer. Just look at the different ways the boys were reported on from the start. Nick is a member of the Backstreet Boys, world famous, an honest to goodness teen idol. And he honed those skills where he grew up, right here in Tampa. A teacher at Miles Elementary School gave him a break, a starring role in the 1990 school play Phantom of the Opera. Nick was 10. She heard about me being in a lower grade and me singing, you know, and um, she auditioned me for the part and she made, they made an exception for me to play the part. I mean, my mom and dad pretty much, you know, saw when Nick could sing really well and then they saw that I was a kick-ass performer, but I, I couldn't sing that well yet. Right. I got better. Yeah. But it just, it took, it took time, you know, because I was kind of a gimmick. Right. You got to understand, my career started off as a comedy gimmick. Because Johnny oh, Wright said it was for, a joke. For, yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. joke. He was wow. planning on doing it as a joke. And all of a sudden, it just it skyrocketed. Montez Dioka held on to the video and mementos of her young pupil for all these years. Because he stood out. When he um, did the play, The Phantom of the Opera, he received a standing ovation. And uh, there were people crying in the audience. And we just couldn't believe the way his voice projected. Down in Tampa, where you grew up. Yeah. You're just a big fan of music. Were you always musical? Were you like early jumping on the keys? Well, the it was. Well, I, I have a, I have an older brother. Yep. His name's Prick Carter. There it is. We love him. We love Prick, him. The prick, Nick <laughs> the Prick. An influence. Um, either way you cut it, right? Man, whatever. He's yeah. an older brother. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, we don't really like each other. Nick was basically the special, talented, serious musician from a young age, while Aaron was a little brother with the silly songs. And that's got to mess with anybody's head. Aaron probably was desperate to prove he was a serious musician just like Nick, which is why he was so insistent on performing his newer music and not just I Want Candy. I mean, imagine having a discography made up of mostly kiddie songs and be known as that. That's how I beat Shaq Kid as an adult. That would be embarrassing, let's be honest. Anyone knows you can't be nearing 30 and still singing Go Jimmy Jimmy. 
I mean, I see loads of K-pop idols still doing that cutesy agio act when they're nearing 30, and it's just cringe, in my opinion. Don't kill me, K-pop fans, please. Aaron, too, often publicly accused Nick of being jealous of him, which loads of Nick defenders laughed at, saying he was just projecting. Yeah, it was clear Aaron was jealous of Nick, but I don't think there was absolutely no negative feelings on Nick's side. From what I saw, I wouldn't say Nick was jealous per se of Aaron, but rather I bet there was resentment towards him. Aaron. It's <laughs> a pretty cool kid, although he's never been above taking advantage of having me in his family. Resentment for the fact that Nick had to work so hard and pave the way, sacrificing much of his childhood. Whereas, Aaron essentially got to skyrocket to fame due to sharing the same name. Regardless, the unhealthy family structure and their careers would have caused a major rift in the brothers' relationship. There is no denying Aaron had serious mental and spiritual issues and that he was oftentimes his worst enemy, especially when he'd get triggered when people would remind him of his old music, though again, he could have associated the old songs with some horrible traumatic memories. He was erratic, clearly addicted. His rambling and public fights with his on and off again fiance was never a good look, but honestly, I don't fully trust Melanie either. Aaron was often accusing her of infidelity and many have witnessed her going off with other guys. Essentially, I think she was just another Hollywood groupie dating him because he's Nick's brother. Again, I don't think he was completely innocent. He'd sadly fight with fans at times online and rant about Jesse McCartney. There were many times he came off narcissistic, but are we surprised about that seeing how he was famous at such a young age? I couldn't imagine being worldwide famous at the age of nine with loads of adoring fans then suddenly be considered a washed up bygone celebrity when you're just in your 20s. That's gonna mess with anybody if they were put in that position. At the end, I do believe he wanted to be a good person, but had zero basis or idea on how to be, given where he came from and the environment he was growing up in. The reason I think he had good intentions was when he wasn't having mental breaks, he was pretty level-headed and kind, and he'd vehemently defend Michael Jackson until the day he died. Michael was another singer he had much in common with. Michael also died in a similar way to... Aaron, saying that his own label were trying to kill him off and that they owed him loads in cash. Also worth mentioning before his death, Aaron was in an interview when he said some producers attempted to bribe him to say Michael harmed him as a boy. Even his own mother Jane was pushing him, but Aaron held his ground. Aaron's last tweet before passing was reaching out to Kanye West, as Kanye was going through his phase of exposing his personal trainer before he disappeared from the public for a couple of months, then reappeared looking very different. Nothing to see here, people. Ultimately, Aaron was another expose on the true nature of the industry. And so many ask what I would say to all this. It would be, we should all pray for him. Pray for his soul and for the forgiveness of his sins. What he needed most on earth, more than therapy, is definitely that. And he definitely needs it now more than ever. In fact, his whole family, Melanie, his son, and everyone he associated with needs prayers. The Carters are clearly a very cursed family, proven even more by the fact that his other sister, Bobby Jean, passed away in 2023, allegedly due to an OD. I gotta feel terrible for Jane, in fact, at this point. Sure, she's probably far from being a good mother, but no mother should ever have to bury three of her own children. May God rest Bobby Jean's soul, too. Now, there are people out there who are still hating on Aaron even years after his passing, and it is so wrong. I'd like to think some people who attacked him feel some regret, but my faith in humanity is so low by now, I'd be more shocked if a good n number were regretful. And I'm expecting there will be some very unhappy responses to my video, but such is life. I followed Aaron's situation for years, researched all the cases deeply for this video to make sure everything was fair, and the conclusion I've come to is what I came to. My intention with this video is to bring awareness to the dark side of the industry and to give Aaron's memory a fair shake. He's needed that and he needed support his whole life and never got it. So I will emphasize again to pray for him because that is the ultimate support anybody can give a person. And also his son who is really going to need them growing up in Hollywood without his father. Rest in peace, Aaron, Leslie, and Bobby Jean. May God bless you all. And prayers for Prince, too. This is Angel Lily at Angel Lily Studio. Thank you for watching.